Today, we're looking at an amazing documentary called At the River, which um, was recently produced. And it chronicles and shares the stories of many people we know personally, um, know their names, and they're oftentimes friends of our congregation here, but remarkable Presbyterian leaders who made a great impact on the civil rights movements through grace and perseverance. This documentary uh, was produced by a woman who grew up in Alabama, but she is actually now lives in Black Mountain. I'm really excited. I get to have a uh, coffee with her on Tuesday. So we're hoping to have a showing um, of this documentary at the river sometime soon when COVID allows, as we have been saying for two years. Um, we are gonna feature two of our, uh, two of the people who are uh, profiled and uh, featured in this film. One is Dr. John Kirkendall, the president or former president of Davidson College. The joke is, is he was president and then he was the interim president. They liked him so much, they hired him twice. Um, and the other one is uh, Dick Harbison, who is the father of Cornelia Hoover. So we are so lucky to have um, both of these stories today. I was gonna sort of summarize because they're very, they're longer clips, but their story is so beautiful. They are so well-spoken. I don't really wanna take that away from them. But what I was really thinking about is why is this important? It's Black History Month, of course. We did our racial history audit, which showed that we have First Presbyterian has oftentimes been complacent or um, guilty of you know, aiding in inequality or racism. And I would love that there are actually um, witnesses and advocates for racial justice in the Presbyterian church. Because if we look at the, um, this is, I read it once and it stuck with me forever, a letter, letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, by Martin Luther King Jr. He was writing um, after he had been arrested and he was talking a little bit about, um, they were viewed as extremists. He says, well, guess who else was an extremist? Jesus Christ. Um, and he asks for uh, the white uh, Christian to engage with uh, creative extremism, which I thought was a wonderful term. And he continues on, he says, I had hoped that the white moderate would see this need, the need for creative extremists, Perhaps I was too optimistic. Perhaps I expected too much. And I should have realized that a few members of the oppressor race can understand the deep groans and passionate yearnings of the oppressed race. And still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. And we'll see how all of these people have been uh, grounded and acted in their strong, persistent, and determined action. Martin Luther King does highlight some uh, notable ad white civil rights activists. And then he also says he's been very uh, greatly disappointed with the white church and its leadership. He does highlight one person. Um, and I like to think here are our own um, people we could name in a letter to a Birmingham, from a Birmingham jail. So this ties in greatly with the work of Martin Luther King Jr. But I will just turn it over um, to the speakers themselves. I thought we could, Look at uh, Dick Harbison's uh, video first, and then just kind of talk about a little bit how it stands out to us, what our first reaction was, um, and just go from there. My father told me that he thought I should leave the state of Mississippi and go somewhere else and get a, yeah, and get a different uh, slant on things. And I really had the idea that Daddy wanted me to go into the Northeast, but uh, as far as I would go, it was Virginia. <laughs> I grew up seeing the injustices. I grew up in a Heavily segregated society, even within a rather progressive city in Fairbanks. But still, I knew it wasn't right. Do you remember the first time you were going up that you realized something was wrong? Do you have a memory of that? Yes, I do. Um, Richard Taylor Harbison called Dick, and I was born and raised in Greenville, Mississippi. Greenville was a lot more progressive than a lot of the communities in Mississippi and even in the Delta. My family would have been considered progressive uh, back in those days. 
my father told me that he thought I should leave the state of Mississippi and go somewhere else and get a, a, yeah, and get a different uh, slant on things. And I really had the idea that they wanted me to go to the Northeast, but uh, as far as I would go to Virginia, <laughs> I grew up seeing the injustices. I grew up in a heavily segregated society, even within a rather progressive city in Atlanta. But still, I knew it wasn't right. Do you remember the first time you were going up that you realized something was wrong? Do you have a memory of that? Yes, I do. Just a moment, um, because this is a, a, a painful memory. Um, it takes me a while to kind of gather my emotions. I was a young boy, six or seven, the most probably. My family lived with my paternal grandmother, whom I adored, and she adored me. And she was a, a, a wonderful lady, very Victorian. She and I were sitting on the back porch of our home having breakfast in the screen porch. And behind our house, there was a quote, servant's house. It had not been used in years. And we were sitting there, and this black lady comes walking up the driveway, and she did not look well at all. And she said to my grandmother, and I was sitting there with my grandmother, she was saying, uh, Ma'am, um, I'm sick. Um, would you mind if I use the bathroom in that house back behind you? And my grandmother said, absolutely no, you cannot use that bathroom. And I didn't say anything. I should have, uh, even at that age, I should have. She was, I was the apple of her eye, and uh, she was uh, as important in my life as my own parents. And I didn't say it. To this day, I have regretted that. But more than that, to this day, I have felt the pain of, uh, of that memory. Mm -hmm. My first church was uh, the first Presbyterian church in Canton, Mississippi in 1958. I was about 26. It was a nice size church. It was a, a church of 350. And uh, Canton was a county seat town and a, a very thriving community. Heavily of uh, black population in Canton and in Madison County. The Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board Board of Education was what set a state like Mississippi into a stance of massive resistance. The Presbytery was at that time called Central Mississippi Presbytery. It was ultra, ultra conservative. As some would say it was fundamentalist. When I was called to the Canton Presbyterian Church, which was considered somewhat of a, a progressive church, I was examined before the preacher, and I was the only item of business for my examination. It lasted for five hours. That included my sermon, which was a 20 minute sermon. Uh, five hours of examination. Even though you were Mississippi born? Oh, yes, that didn't help at all with, uh, uh, with that examination. And um, I, I, I was accepted. The, 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 there was a divided vote, uh, but uh, those accepting me uh, won out. What kind of questions were they trying to get you tossed out for? Uh, they wanted me to take uh, the Bible uh, as literally inerrant, literal and inerrant, um, in all ways, and I could not accept that. Uh, they also believed. Um, some of the people, uh, a majority of them, I believe, in what would be called double predestination. 
uh, you are not only predestined uh, uh, to everlasting life, but you're predestined to hell as well. I, I could not uh, accept that at all. So you told them what you really thought. I, I did. I told them what I really thought. And they do. I, I, I was a test case for them. I probably was the first uh, student to come from Union Seminary at Richmond for some time. And uh, at that time, the ultra conservatives had taken over the Presbyterian. They say they, they had a majority. And uh, I think they were really trying to say that no more from that liberal seminary in Richmond. So you managed to squeak through. It was ordained. I was in Canton a little over six years. Then in, I would say, February of 1964, the Blacks began voter registration launches. It was just about 250 local Blacks who started off several blocks from the courthouse and very peacefully and slowly came up to the courthouse and stood there all day waiting to be registered to vote. And at that time, Mississippi had a voter registration test. And I think I should tell you about my taking that test. I went down to register the vote. And I remember the question. It said, interpret the following. And it gave me two paragraphs from the Mississippi Constitution. And I read it over twice. And I went over to the registrar. Uh, and I said, I don't understand a word of this legal legalese. He said, write anything you want to. Point B, that those who were acceptable would be accepted. And blacks, obviously, would not be acceptable. I received a telephone call from one of the uh, Protestant ministers um, that afternoon, one afternoon in February. And he said that uh, the, uh, some of the prominent citizens were going to plan, uh, they were going to have a mass meeting of the of white men uh, and business owners, and they would like for the ministers to come also at the courthouse. So I planned not to go because I had a feeling it was definitely a Citizens Council uh, sponsored meeting. But I called up the editor of the local weekly newspaper, which was a, a very, for Mississippi, a progressive uh, weekly newspaper. He said, Dick, it is a citizen council meeting, but he said, if I was you, I'd be there. He said, if you want to have, these were his words, your uh, finger on the pulse of this community, you need to be there tonight. So I went, and the courthouse was filled. What it came down to was, was this, that every white business in town, uh, owner, manager, whatever, was expected to join the White Citizens Council. And every business was to display a White Citizens Council detail on the front door or window of their business establishment. I went down early that morning to go to the post office and pick up my mail. And as I was walking through the courthouse square, I noticed this man in a blue suit. And then I recognized that he was one of the local Protestant ministers, the one who had become the chaplain of the Citizens Council. And he had a camera in his hand. And he had the helmet on. And he, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to set up <clears throat> um, a camera and photograph every black who attempts to register. And then the photographs will be shown at my church on Sunday evening after the worship service. In June, the students began coming into Canton, as I was in Canton, 
and uh, they came to tour the blacks in helping them to pass the written examination, how to handle the examination, and so forth. Three of the students started worshiping at First Presbyterian Church. My wife and I invited them to come by our home uh, for coffee and uh, cookies and that sort of thing. They were young, idealistic college boys who wanted to come to the South and, and help out. They were white boys, yes. One Saturday, uh, I received a telephone call that uh, there were about five or six of my uh, men, members of my church, who wanted to come out and see me. They told me, we love our church and we love our community. And our church is out of step with the community. The community is showing no hospitality to these outside agitators or whatever they were called. And therefore, the Brevetian Church is the uh, it is out of step with the community. And uh, we want you to see to it that these students are not allowed to enter the church uh, tomorrow. And I said, uh, I will not do that. They are welcome. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, by this point, the session had uh, at least implicitly approved seating these uh, <clears throat> three uh, young students. At a meeting of the session, one of the elders made a motion that they be barred from worshiping in the church. The motion died for lack of a second. So I told these men that, and that these boys were welcome uh, to stay. I was afraid something bad was going to happen, but I didn't know what. The next morning, I walked into session meeting, and the session members were in disarray. There was some crying, uh, and there was some sitting in the back, not knowing what to do. And there was one elder who had been the elder who had tried to get me to become chaplain of the Citizen Council, handing out a resolution. It said that anybody associated uh, with the Civil Rights Movement, anybody associated with the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, uh, NAACP, so on and so on, all the Communist Party, all of these things would not be uh, admitted into the First Revolution Church. And I, I said, okay, uh, I will allow this resolution to come to a vote. And it came to a vote and it failed to pass. Now, as I remember, something like um, um, six to three uh, defeated it. And I have been told that these men who had come to see me the day before asked me to tell the students they could come had barred those students from coming. They stood at the door, and when the students came up, they told them they were not welcome. I then went into the worship service and called the worship service on and said, today, uh, the church has been taken over by someone else, and it is not the church of Jesus Christ, and I will not be in worship. So that uh, was the, the they knew more, yes, so, so to speak, of, of what led up uh, to the summer of 1964. After I had called off the worship service, they had barred the door. The next Sunday, and every Sunday after that, these same men, the White Citizen Council, members of my church, stood at the front door to make sure that no uh, civil rights workers would enter the church. Well, of course, none of them came back once they'd been turned away. There was a lady in the church, an elderly lady by the name of Miss Lydia. And Miss Lydia went up to each one of them. She knew them by name, and she said to each one she asked them, she said, Do I do I have your permission to worship in my church? And one of them said, Oh, Miss Lydia. She said, No. Obviously, I must have your permission to worship in my church. Brave woman. Brave. I went on vacation. During my absence, the session was called. A lot of pressure was brought to bear on the session. And the session 
then voted overwhelmingly that to pass the resolution that all of these people would be refused um, to, uh, to, to worship at First Baptist Church. When I got back from vacation, I discovered that that resolution had been passed in my absence, and I then announced to the congregation that I would be leaving. It broke my heart because this church had stood for something that was so important during this entire civil rights movement. so much for, to Dick Harbison for sharing that amazing story. I wanted to um, open the floor up to people's reactions. Was there, I have a you know, prepared questions, but I'd love to see what we are interested uh, in discussing. I, um, were there anything that stood out for you from this, either reflected on a personal experience or learned something, pose that to the room or the Zoom? Whenever I prepare questions, I learn y'all's comments and questions are much better. So I've learned to start with those. It, Robert, I mean, we all read, um, and it's old now, but Dozen More Let's <clears throat> Magic Time. Dozen More Let's, he used to be uh, editorial cartoonist at the Zerber. And then he moved to New York and he, he was one over her hit by car. But anyway, this book, Magic Time, it's fiction. But it's about the Freedom Summer, it's in 64 in Mississippi, and then it comes up into the 90s later. But it is based on, uh, you know, the, the events that happened, like the, the Freedom Riders that were killed and so forth, different names and that kind of thing. But it's a, I, that's just one of my favorite books. And just hearing him talk uh, reminded me of the events that happened in that book. Absolutely. I'm going to, I was adding that to my book list. Yeah, for sure. yeah it's very readable. One thing I was I thought was remarkable, that was his first call. Yeah. To have such vision, I mean, an understanding clarity of what your role is in a community, in a congregation. Um, I would not have been able to do that just a few years ago. So that was really remarkable. Anything, Zoom, would y'all like to um, share any of your understanding or things you learned? Well, one of the stories I thought was, um, he re remarked upon his, about his, the story with his grandmother when he first started noticing something was wrong. I love the description of great Victorian lady. I imagine my great grandmother and I literally have her Victorian settee in my bedroom. Um, so I understand that. But to have someone you love so much who is such a great influence in your life and to realize they are flawed, maybe your values are different, but it's almost sort of, you realize something about them that is almost earth shattering or at least foundation shaking. How do we deal with that um, when we encounter? Well, most of us in the South were, you know, we trained, I guess, to respect our elders. And if my grandmother had said that to me, you know, I wouldn't have said word, you know. Maybe even if I knew it was wrong at the time, I would not have disputed her. <laughs> Absolutely. You'll hear in Dr. Kurgendahl's um, uh, video in a moment, is he has the same experience with his grandfather. He was the president of Queens, uh, much at the time, but... Um, so it's very similar. Anyone on Zoom would like to share sort of when 
Robert. This, hey, this is Cornelia Hoover. Hi, Cornelia. How are you? I didn't want to intrude, but I did want to thank you for showing this video. And it is all very true. And um, I was a young child in Canton at the time, um, just a baby, two or three years old. But my father has told that story so many times. Um, he's of having, I think it was a completely uh, huge moment in his life when he had to stand in the pulpit and refused to hold the worship service because it was no longer a church of Jesus Christ when you bar people from entering. But, um, it's, but for my whole life, he's always stood strong in his um, values and his opinions and fought for civil rights. And just to let you know, he's doing so well. He's almost 90 years old and still lives in Virginia. That's remarkable. Well, thank you so much, Cornelia. Can you share anything, or if, you, if you're comfortable with it, can you share sort of how this is influences ministry or work for um, race, racial equality moving like later in life? Well, we always, you know, we they, well, after that, my mother said, you've got to get me out of Mississippi. So, um, because they did, the citizens, white citizens council would come to our house. And at the time, you know, we were a family of three, you know, my dad had three children and went on to move to Lexington, Kentucky. And we had my little brother, but he always, um, there was never an issue, you know, black and whites were equal. And he brought us up that way. We went different ministries. We moved to Pensacola, Florida, and he enrolled all of us in the public school down the street that no white children went to, but the Harbison kids did. Um, and started, you know, just really um, working to, um, to build, to break down barriers. And he did that as, as society has moved forward also. Um, he, from the early days has been a strong, um, voice for homosexuality and equality and acceptance. And um, many times has taught Sunday school classes where he refutes uh, so many of the passages in the Bible um, on certain things. So he's, it's just always, he's been a very progressive uh, minister, I think, throughout his career. Thank you. Any other comments about Herbert Harbison's story? I liked the Miss Lillian story. I was like, how many Miss Lillians do we have here? And sort of, how do you become a Miss Lillian? In, in her, not, you know, you get old, but no. Um, but how do you become Miss Lillian? So sure in her faith and her understanding to be able to stand to what seems intimidating, but you know, she probably taught them in Sunday school and thought, I brought, as my mother used to say, I brought you in this world and I will take you out. Yes. But, um, this, I would, this is really remarkable. Just looking at the time, I just sort of want to make sure we get um, enough time to look at Dr. Kirkendall's as well. But um, there's a wonderful website that features a lot of these. We have in the series is Pat Miller, the Old Testament scholar. Um, uh, let's see, Ted Wardlaw, the president of Austin Seminary. Um, who else? I mean, it is just people that we all know um, and love. Who have, what I realize is how many of these people have been so influential in the church today but also my personal faith and education and how much, like what work they did that I had no clue about. I just love that so much. Ross, were you gonna share something? <laughs> well, I guess I just wanted to say, I didn't, what the obvious was that, that he had incredible courage um, and that my, my guess is not very many people had, had that kind of courage. Uh, you know, I don't know how you muster that other than the, your own deep faith. Um, in, in following your, your faith. Um, we did have a pastor in Delaware where we used to live that had marched, marched with Martin Luther King in his background. Uh, and he didn't really make much of it when we talked about it with him. Um, but I'm just really impressed with that kind of courage. I, when I think about the complacent whites that Martin Luther King talks about, it's not that they didn't care, or I mean, some didn't, but. I almost think that some of them were cared or saw the, you know, the work that needed to be done, but were scared, unfortunately. Um, well, yeah, that's what Kim was saying. Yeah, the, the enemy was the moderate mm -hmm. white, uh, because the people that were really outspokenly racist, you know, you knew the black and white. I mean, I shouldn't have said that kind of metaphor, but you knew, you know, which side everybody was on. But the people that just said, like, why, why do we have to do anything? Why can't we just wait? Why can't we wait? 
that was the um that's what Martin Luther King Jr. was most upset about worried about and thank you Barbara you said the moderate white not the complacent white right. that's his terms that's right I spoke so absolutely well I will turn it over um and now I know how to do this and so thank y'all for being patient with my education Hal's teaching next week so he's gonna be excellent because I made all the mistakes this week um but we're gonna look at Dr. Kirkendall's video and oops, that's not very much He shares many um, similar stories, uh, but you know, with his own perspective. Thank you. Y'all had so much confidence. That's what key verse gets you. Rich Nightingale telling you what you did wrong, man. Helping you out from with this still small voice. Kind of 
interaction in terms. I would eat at the kitchen table with her when I ate my lunch, but there's no question of her coming in eating with family at the big table because that just didn't happen. My whole family was quite paternalistic, not mean spirited, but very determined that there should be segregation uh, between the races and that there was a difference in terms of capacity to do and to be. And that was just kind of a given in their world. Do you remember when you began the story I often tell told too much about lying on the floor in my grandfather's study. He was working on a sermon or something. I was a Presbyterian minister and he was for many years president of Queens College in Charlotte. But I was lying on the floor and I was looking at sports pages. I was really just absolutely an addict to baseball at that time. I said something to the effect of Miss Jackie Robinson must really be a good baseball player. And my grandfather very curtly said, and I never heard him say this in the way that he said, but he can't be because he's black. He didn't use the word black. But he can't be a good player. And I was lying there on the floor and I had this this kind of disjunction in my own mind. The guy's betting 320. He's stolen 30 <laughs> bases. He's hit 20 home runs. He's golden glove infielder. And this guy says he's not a good baseball player. He don't know baseball. He may know a lot of things, but he doesn't know baseball. Well that's kind of a clip there. Fast forward any number of years and when we went to Dr. King's funeral and I saw this elderly black man kind of struggling to get up the hill, big guy, nicely dressed, suit and tie, hot day, and he was just uh, perspiring profusely at Jack Robinson. And I just kind of, the crowd was mixing and mingling and I just kind of yelled over next to him. Long, for a long while, finally I had the courage that I don't have at this day to say, Mr. Robinson, I said, yes. I said, now shake your hand. He said, show me. And I said, it's a story that doesn't want retelling, but you've been alive in my life. And I thank you. And then the crowd just went that way. But I, you know, that first little, that, that's a retrospective to say that I was becoming sensitive you know, at that early age, maybe 10, 11 years old. The other thing I remember that, that really sticks in my mind uh, very vividly was when uh, Brown versus Board of Education came down in 54. And I was in high school, and the day that the decision came down, I was to go with some other people from my youth group with our uh, director of Christian education. We wanted to do a work on school. And we all piled in the back of her car, and people were talking about the decision. And um, somebody said, Well, my parents don't let me go to school with them. I've got to go off to school. They don't send me a McCauley, they're going to send me to Darling, they're going to send me somewhere where I can be in a segregated situation. And then our recent dear woman said, You ever wondered what the Christian thing to do in this situation might be? And it brought me up short. Pilate asked you, What is truth? Jesus said, Pilate, ships in the night, at least it looks that way to me. Jesus had just been telling Pilate that his mission in this world was to testify to the truth, to testify to the faithful and consistent presence of God as the source of meaning in human life. Jesus said, quite simply, I came into the world to testify to the truth. So Pilate says, what is the truth? I found the, the discipline of being in school and studying theology and that sort of thing. I found it just absolutely true, but it didn't quite. I'm called to the ministry, and in the meantime, got married to Missy, and Missy was very encouraging about the idea of going to seminary, which, which helped me a great deal. When Wallace Austin called me, and he said, how'd you like to come to all the every camps minister? I said, boy, would I? I can't stand here. I had had one other uh, nibble, and that was a church in Magnolia, Mississippi, uh, a region I didn't know. And my, one of my friends at seminary went down there to interview those people, and they'd like to kill me just on the interview, so as well, I didn't go. I would put the question on the table, and either he was, wasn't willing to wait around for an answer, 
or the answer that he got was only a profound and enigmatic silence. So then he left the question for the rest of us in generations yet unborn to ponder as we seek to find the path through the day by day. My predecessor, a fellow named Tom Murphy, started the Lee County Children's Camp. And there was a primitive facility that was owned by the city of Opelika, the twin city to Auburn, called Spring Villa. And it had a few cabins and it had a dining hall, just a kind of basic camp. Spring Villa was segregated illegally, but segregated was a public property. I had really begun in my mind the question how do you bring the races together in Alabama? When I'd been at Yale for that one year, that was the, the time when the National Council of Churches were doing things in Mississippi. And the people at Yale would uh, get out of class on Friday and get in the car and they'd drive all the way to Mississippi and to spend the night on Saturday night in the sharecropper's house. And then they'd get a Sunday come back and they'd made their witness. And I thought that was just shallow. We really want to do something for Christian faith. You come down and you stay. You've told me many times what you heard. What I saw was, folks, we talked about this last time, did it? It is a truism, I think, that you do not just live in the world. A world lives in you. And the world that inhabits each one of us just now is one in which the coin of the realm, both in public and private discourse, seems more and more to be a failure to tell the truth. I don't think people realize what we're all doing. Well, it's a complicated story, too, because it feels, in some ways, it feels so naive from our standpoint right now. But it's real. I was aware of this kind of uh, gap between what goes on in my family, what goes on in my own heart, and how do you reconcile those two things? It really caused me a lot of, a lot of anguish personally. I'm very conscious of, of their feelings. And as much as I had my strong conviction, it was not in my nature to try to make my parents upset with me, angry with me. So, for example, when I was at seminary and I went to Washington to demonstrate for the 1964 Civil Rights Act and stood in front of the Lincoln Monument, I didn't tell my parents. My parents made, never did make that change, true. What does what you believe have to do with what you say and what you hear and how you interpret the things you hear in an age and situation in which the line between truth and falsehood is being so vigorously and variously drawn and challenged. Wallace was going out of town and it was race relations Sunday. He said, you know, you never have really preached on it. You never come clean with this crowd. I told the you are. And he always talked about it. He's so sweet. I was very, I was very subtle. I wouldn't necessarily sweet. But, but he said, you got to, you got to tell them. So uh, I just kind of reared back and, and I preached a sermon that was entitled um, Black Rage and White Christians. And I didn't leave a whole lot unsaid. You know, it's kind of like bringing the whole load and dumping it on one plant, hoping it would grow. And so church was over that morning and, and people, the good friends, were a little bit abashed to be talked to them. man, I guess, but I was a little embarrassed and I felt kind of, Blown away the way I did, lost all subtlety there. And so they come toward the back door where I shake a hand, it beer off one side, go to the other side. And I, as I told you that night, here comes old Mr. Colton. He was 90 if he was a day, and he was one of those people for whom uh, that little line was in the book and said, Don't stand if you can. You know, those who are able, please stand. He couldn't stand. He's coming out on the game. He comes to the door and he sticks out his hand and says, Preacher, that was my kind of sermon. Oh, oh. I found a liberal in this place. He said, 20 minutes. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
can our Zoom friends hear me? I'm so sorry. I've got to run to worship. Um, and obviously, uh, would y'all mind just closing out? I don't know. I'll put that away. Um, just closing out of that. Tristan, oh, Tristan, thank you yeah. so much. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much. And thank you for our Zoom. I'm going to let the video play so they all can finish it. The website's absolutely wonderful. We'll link, share that with y'all as well. And as I said, we're hopefully to have a full screening of the full documentary at some point. But thank you all so much for coming this week. Don't forget Theo Ed and Hal Clark is teaching next week, which will be smoother than this. Yeah. But thank you all. See you later. In that period of time, that vegetable food was supposed to be fed. Even in preaching that was, a, that was essentially pastoral in tone, we were talking to people about the food in their lives. There had to be that kind of nature of prophecy that undergirded the whole thing.